Well, this evening, or this morning, excuse me, as I've already told you, we are going to be looking at um, uh, the continuation of um, uh, what it is that Jesus goes through in this trial in John chapter 18, but we're also going to combine it with what we saw in Matthew's gospel to get a fuller picture. So let me now read to you our text from John chapter 18, beginning in verse 12 through verse 24. John writes this, So the Roman cohorts and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Annas first, for he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people, as we saw earlier. Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple, Now, that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside, so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire for it was cold and they were warming themselves and Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? So Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now the interesting thing here is that This is the totality of what John records of the trial that Jesus was put under because the next passage then completes the two further denials of Peter. And then in verse 28, we read, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium where then he's handed over to the Romans. So basically, this is all we're going to read in John regarding that trial, which is why I wanted to go back into Matthew's gospel as well. So again, let's consider as we look at these different events the injustices that were being done to our Lord Jesus that he submitted to for us. Now, last time we saw, and we also just saw right here, that Jesus handed himself over willingly to his enemies, and he did it for our salvation. Nobody took away his life. Jesus gave it for us freely. Uh, We saw last time there were several things that Jesus could have done to prevent his arrest. I mean, he had already avoided capture so many times before in a variety of ways. He could have done so then, but he didn't because his time had come, the time now when he would lay down his life. Now, the last steps of his journey to the cross were about to be completed. Now we see what it is that he would endure for us to bring us to God. Now, we've already seen his arrest. We've already seen he was bound. This morning, we see the second of these steps to the cross. Now we see that he's put on trial, and he's condemned, and he is abused for us. Now, what I want us to consider this morning are basically three things. Uh, Where Jesus was put on trial, because there's a little bit of confusion here, who was present at the trial, because John doesn't really give us a full description of who was there, and most importantly, the proceedings and the outcome of his trial. And again, we'll combine this, what we see in John, with what we read earlier in Matthew 26. Now, first of all, let's consider where Jesus was put on trial. And where he was put on trial was clearly at Caiaphas' house, not at Annas' house. Now, I I want us to look at this because from the two texts that I've just read, there there appears to be a confusion as to where these things took place. Now, John tells us that after Jesus was taken into custody, he was first taken to the house of Annas, 
who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was married to Annas' daughter. We read in verses 12 and 13 of John 18. So the Roman cohorts and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Annas first. For he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, and I want you to notice here, we'll look at this again in just a moment. He was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now verse 24 then, at the end of our text, appears to tell us what happens after the events that come in between these two passages. That Jesus was sent to Caiaphas after this what we read about in basic, basically in verses 19 through 23. John writes in verse 24, So Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, again, we would be led to believe from this, at least the way it's translated, that what takes place between verses 12 and 13 and verse 24 all takes place in Annas's house. But if that is the case, then we run into a bit of confusion. Now, the confusion begins in verses 15 through 18, where John records Peter's first denial. I want you to notice that John breaks it up here uh, in, his, in his gospel. Uh, we read that in, in what we just read, that Peter denied that he even knew Jesus to the slave girl who kept the door. And then after he is bound and led to Caiaphas, at least if that's what verse 24 is saying, Peter denies him two more times. But if that is the case, it contradicts what Matthew told us, which is that all three denials took place at Caiaphas' house. So let's look at that text again. Matthew writes in Matthew 26, verses 57 and 58. Those who had seized Jesus, this is in the garden, led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. Notice Caiaphas is the high priest where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now, Matthew tells us quite clearly that they took Jesus to Caiaphas' house and the courtyard that Peter entered into was the courtyard at Caiaphas' house, not at Annas' house. Secondly, John tells us that the trials that Jesus Went, were going, was going through, and that all of Peter's denials, they took place at the house of the high priest. Again, let's look at verses 15 and 16 of John 18. Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Now, I already told you that John told us in, in verse 13 that Caiaphas was the high priest. So clearly, uh, Peter and Jesus in this text are at the house of Caiaphas. So now we have to make sense out of verse 24 which seems to tell us that Jesus was tried at the house of Annas and that Peter denied him at the house of Annas. And then after that happened, he was bound and taken to Caiaphas where he was continued to be tried, that is Jesus, and where Peter then denied him the next two times. Now, I've just said all this simply to say this. We, to make sense of verse 24, we need to see that John is, is telling us that um, after he describes the events of the trial, he tells us, what had happened earlier. In other words, verse 24 is simply telling us what had happened after, they, after Jesus was brought to Annas' house, but he tells us after he tells us what happens at Caiaphas' house. This verse should be translated basically in the way the King James Version translates it, which is basically a, a parenthesis. This is the way the King James Version translates verse 24. Now Annas had sent him bound to Caiaphas' the high priest. In other words, that verse is reflecting on something that took place earlier and where we are is at Caiaphas's house, not at Annas' house. And the reason why I went through that is because I just read to you in Matthew 26 that all this took place at Caiaphas' house and John seems to be saying it's taking place at Annas' house. So in case you happen to pick up on that, 
I just want you to see that this is taking place at Caiaphas' house. Now, secondly, let's consider who was present at Caiaphas' house at this trial of Jesus. Well, Matthew tells us in verse 57 in chapter 26, those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. Mark tells us in chapter 14, verse 53, they led Jesus away to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together. Now, why is that important? Well, because from John's description, it almost sounds like there's just a handful of officials there, Caiaphas and a handful of officials almost like this mock court for this mock trial, but what we need to see is that this was a full meeting of the Sanhedrin, basically the supreme judicial council of the Jews and the administrative leadership of Israel. These were the builders, you see, the builders of Israel, the leaders of Israel, those who had the authority over Israel, and they had all gathered together for one purpose, and that purpose we saw back in John chapter 11, to put Jesus to death, to fulfill that prophecy that Caiaphas had made earlier when he had gathered them all together and said, Jesus has to die. I hope you all see that. Jesus has to die for the well-being of our nation. And he didn't even know what he was saying. He was fulfilling basically or telling what God was going to do, but his whole thinking behind it was entirely different. In John chapter 11, verses 49 through 52, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad, and that would include the Gentiles, that would include us. And all of this, again, was to fulfill what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 118, verses 22 through 23, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. The fact that that rejected stone became the chief cornerstone was the Lord's doing, but also that the builders of Israel rejected him because God did not give them eyes to see or ears to hear. He gave them over to their sinful, wicked hearts that they might crucify His Son so that He might save us. And Jesus willingly gave Himself into their hands for this very reason. But again, I want you to note, this rejection that Jesus is suffering or is going to suffer here at this trial comes at the hands of His own people, the leadership of Israel, the builders of Israel. This is what he was willing to endure for us. Now, thirdly, we see how the trial proceeds and we see its outcome. First of all, Caiaphas tries to get Jesus to incriminate himself. Make it easy on us, Jesus. Tell us, you know, tell us something we can hang you with is basically what he's doing here. But we read in verses 19 through 21. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together, and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. So again, instead of bringing charges, which is what Caiaphas' obligation was as high priest, was to bring charges if there were charges to be brought. Instead, he tries to entrap Jesus by getting him to admit to things that perhaps he taught his disciples in secret or maybe things he had taught openly that could be used against him. And I think he was likely probing to see if Jesus would say that he had come to overthrow the Romans as the Jews expected. If he said that, well, then he'd have charges to bring against him to the Romans. They could get rid of him. Or if he blasphemed, uh, that would do as well. You know, he's, he's broken our law. Our law says he must be put to death, but we don't have a law that says we can put him to death. So the Romans would put him to death on the one hand if he was an insurrectionist. On the other hand, the Jews would insist to be put to death if he blasphemed. But notice, first of all, Jesus said nothing about his disciples, 
You know, tell us about your disciples. No, Jesus left them out of the picture because he was protecting them, as we saw before. But he did answer regarding his teaching, that he had spoken openly, and not just to the disciples, but to all the people in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews were gathered together. And even when he explained things more clearly to his disciples in private, it was always based upon his public teaching. But then Jesus asked Caiaphas why he was questioning him. The proper thing to do would be not to ask the, the one who's accused, and actually he hadn't even been accused yet, of testifying against himself, but where are your witnesses, Caiaphas? I have spoken openly. Why don't you ask those who heard what I said to testify? Well, instead of, um, well, why, why not do it the right way, basically? Jesus was politely suggesting that the proceedings be done in a, in a right and an orderly way. If I'm going to be put on trial according to the rules, you need to bring witnesses to advance the charges against me. You're not advancing charges. You're simply asking me to incriminate myself. In other words, Jesus is saying, these things aren't going the way they should be going. This is what you should be doing. Well, when Jesus said this, one of the officers near him responded in an unlawful way. We read in verses 22 and 23. When he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus, saying, is, is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if I've spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? Now, what Jesus is pointing out is the officer was handling this also inappropriately, uh, pointing out their, their errors. Now, why did the officer strike him? Well, he might have been showing the court, I am not a follower of Jesus, I want to make that clear, so I'm just going to show my contempt. And undoubtedly, he wasn't a follower of Jesus, and he did hate Jesus along with the rest of them. Or he may have been trying to impress the high priest. But whatever the reason, what he did was unjust. And nobody cared. The court didn't care. The high priest didn't care because they hated Jesus. They probably approved of it. They mean they wanted to kill him. Well, since no one else seemed interested in whether or not this abuse that Jesus had just received was right or wrong, Jesus defended himself. But he didn't do it in an angry way, but in a very mild and reasonable way, saying to the officer, if I've done something wrong, then bear witness to that wrong. If I had said it improperly, then then bear witness that, tell the court, the right thing to do would be simply to point it out, but not to strike me against the law. Now, the council should have reproved the officer for this, for that miscarriage of justice, but again, it didn't because they hated Jesus, again, showing you the, the intent of the court. But again, I want us to see that Jesus very patiently endured this, this abuse because he was giving himself over to us. He knew what he, what he was going to expect. Remember when he was in the garden and he was praying? He knew what was ahead of him and he knew this was going to happen, but he was willing to go through it. Now, since the high priest's attempt to have Jesus incriminate himself failed, he then turned to some other means, basically the same means that Jezebel used when she tried to get Nabal's vineyard, which was next door to Ahab's, and that is hiring a couple of worthless men to bear false witness against him so that they would have the pretense to put Nabal to death and then Ahab could take his vineyard. Well, they did the same thing here. The court began looking for someone who was willing to bring false charges against Jesus. But this also failed. We read in Matthew 26, verses 59 and 60. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. They did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. So again, they're thwarted. But finally, two men did come forward with a false charge regarding what Jesus had said at the beginning of his ministry regarding the temple. We read at the end of uh, verse 60 and verse 61. But later on, two came forward and said, this man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Now, Jesus, of course, did not say that he could destroy the temple. 
although he could have if, if he wanted to. He could have called angels down. He could have simply made the earthquake. He could have had the temple swallowed into the ground if that's what he wanted. But he never said that. What he said was in John 2, 19, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And of course, we know Jesus was not talking about that temple, but he was talking about the temple of his body. How after he was crucified, destroy this body, put me to death, and in three days I will raise it up again. That is, he would raise up the temple of his body. He would be raised again to life. Now, one thing to notice here is that Jesus did not answer any of these charges. He didn't answer any of the false charges because they were completely unfounded. When somebody brings false charges against you, you can, of course, you know, uh, protest your innocence. You can try to work to overcome them, or you can just simply remain silent. And we know our Lord Jesus Christ, as a lamb led to the slaughter, did remain silent. But this last failure on the high priest's part to, to, to get false charges to bring Jesus uh, to death, as it were, to, to be able to condemn him, he finally resorts to one last thing. And basically, it was an authority that he had, which obviously he knew that he had, that would force Jesus to speak and incriminate himself. We read in verses 62 and 63. The high priest stood up and said to him, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now, when Jesus refused to answer the charges, Caiaphas, of course, got angry. And basically, he, he cut to the chase. He cut through the Gordian knot, as it were. He went straight to the, to the root and he used an authority which was granted to him by God. He knew what Jesus had been claiming about himself, and so he charged Jesus to swear an oath in the name of the living God, as he had the authority to do as the high priest, to tell the court who he really was. Now, Caiaphas knew that Jesus had to answer this question because the law required it, and Jesus, he knew Jesus would not disobey. We read in Leviticus 5.1 this. Now, if a person sins after he hears a public adjuration to testify when he is a witness, whether he has seen or otherwise known, if he does not tell it, then he will bear his guilt. Basically, it's saying that if, if you are called to bear witness to something, publicly adjured to do so, which is exactly what the high priest did, you, if you do not answer then you're sinning and you will bear your guilt. Jesus, of course, would not sin against God's commandments. And so Jesus did not disappoint the high priest, but he says in verse 64, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, Jesus didn't need to repeat what Caiaphas said. Jesus was telling Caiaphas, you're right, I am the Christ, I am the Son of the living God. And he went on to say uh, that perhaps Caiaphas didn't believe that now, but one day he would believe it, one day he would see that retribution. Basically, Jesus is perhaps speaking the last words that he thought he would be able to speak before sentence was pronounced. When, the, when he would see the Son of Man exalted to the right hand of power, when would Caiaphas see that? Well, he would see it in 70 A.D. when Jesus pours out his wrath against the Jews by, you know, through the Romans, besieging the city, tearing down the temple, and everything that he talked about in Matthew 24 basically comes to pass. He told the high priest that he would see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. By that, he didn't mean that Caiaphas... Uh, on, on the day when Jesus comes again, which is still future from us, from, from hell would see Jesus coming again, but basically he was telling him that he would see him coming in vengeance against Jerusalem. And when he saw that, he would know that Jesus was exalted to the right hand of power. In other words, Jesus had the authority. He was king over all, and he had the authority to be able to do this. Now, even though Jesus spoke the truth according to what the high priest had, had basically adjured him to do, this was all they needed to condemn him. What he said was true. He, he didn't perjure himself. He wasn't a liar. Uh, 
but in their eyes he was a blasphemer. And so we read in verses 65 and 66. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, He deserves death. But since they didn't have the authority to put him to death, now if he had, you know, again, either way, they were going to have to hand him over to the Romans. If he had said, yes, I'm the Messiah and I've come to overthrow the Romans, well, then they could hand him over to the Romans for that. But they didn't have the authority to put a man to death. And even though they tried to kill him on several occasions, remember, they, they were always concerned about how this would affect the people. If the people see that we do away with him, then what are they going to think of us? So they felt bound to hand him over to the Romans to do this, and that's what they determined to do at this point. But before they did, they first showed their contempt for him. And we read in verses 67 and 68, then they spat at his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Now again, just consider that what our Lord Jesus went through was a huge miscarriage of justice. It was a mockery. It was, it was born out of hatred, out of contempt, out of desire only to kill him. And this abuse was unjust. I mean, even if Jesus had done what they thought he had done, he did not deserve this kind of treatment, but particularly because of who he is. He is the Son of God. He is God in human flesh, and he was willing to submit himself to this so that he might save us. Now, I wanted to go through all of this before I made the, this, this last uh, application, and this, this is where the rubber meets the road. I mean, what, I mean okay, what, what are we supposed to gather from this? Well, first of all, I wanted you to see again a continuing refrain of the Lord's love for us. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, if you're trusting Him, if you're turning from your sins, if you're following Him, everything that He went through here, He went through willingly, and He went through it for you. He was arrested for you. He was bound for you. His humiliation was for you, the entirety of it. This mock trial, the fact that He submitted to it, He did this for you. The hatred that he endured from them, he did this for you. That rejection and that condemnation, not just of the Gentiles, the Gentiles were actually more willing to receive him than his own people, but these, this was his own people that, that abused him, that rejected him, that condemned him. All of this he went through, he went through for you, and he did this because of his love for you, because he wanted to save you because He wanted you to be with Him throughout all eternity. Jesus submitted to this rejection, to this condemnation, to all this abuse for you, out of love for you. So again, what should your response be? What should my response be if we have received this love, if we have received the love of Christ, had our sins forgiven, and we know this love is for us, what should our response be? Well, if Jesus was willing to suffer in this way for us, how much more should we be willing to suffer for Him? Whatever it is, we have to suffer. Now, I want to just point out the particular thing that He suffered here was rejection. Rejection by His own people, by His own culture. The Jews, that was His people. One of the things, perhaps more than any other, that keeps us from living how Jesus would have us to live or sharing his message with others is really fear of what our people are going to think about us. The fear that we're going to be rejected because we don't fit in, because we're out of step, because we're strange, we're behaving strangely, we believe strangely, we're, we're different. And you know how people respond to things that are different, right? They... They just, they just feel alienated from that or they think, you know, we're strange. They want to kind of separate from us. Uh, that fear of rejection, that fear of being condemned, that fear that other people are going to make fun of us or abuse us, those are the things that keep us from shining as lights in this world, from telling other people about Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus did that for us. 
he bore the reproach of Messiah, even as Moses did. You remember, Moses could have enjoyed the wealth of Egypt, but he looked down the road at what was going to happen to Egypt, and he looked down the road at what was going to happen to the people of God, and he says, you know what? Even though I have to give up all this wealth and all this pleasure and all this prestige, everything that, that the world is after, at least I won't be destroyed with the world. I'd rather suffer with the people of God. I'd rather have God as my God. I would rather be with Him for an eternity. So that's what I'm going to choose, and that's what Jesus chose. You know, Jesus told us in advance that if we followed Him, that's exactly what we should expect, that we would be treated in precisely the same way that He was treated. That was a part of the cost that we, He called us to be willing to pay before we followed Him. Jesus says in John 15, verses 18 and 19, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. If you were of the world, the world would love you. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. I mean, just look around. Who is it that the world hates? It it's, doesn't seem to be the Muslims. It doesn't seem to be those that are involved in sexual perversions. It, it doesn't seem to be those living an immoral lifestyle, but it does appear to be those that are Christians, exactly as Jesus said. Nobody likes to be hated. We don't like being hated, but that is the cost to following Jesus. Jesus said, the world hated me, and we see the world hating him. These leaders of the Jewish church were of the world. They were not God's people. I mean, they were in a certain sense God's people. He had chosen them and set them apart. They were the old covenant church, but their hearts were of the world. When they died, they went to hell if they didn't repent. The fact that they were in the church didn't take them out of the world. Jesus was hated by the world, and he was referring to these Jewish leaders. And John tells us in 1 John 3.13, then, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. If you're going to follow Jesus, that is what you have to expect that is what Jesus told you to expect. That's actually what happens, and you have to be willing to pay this price. Now, again, if Jesus was willing to do this for you, if Jesus left you this example, this is what you and I need to do. We need to follow Him in this example and not hide as Christians because we're afraid that we're going to have to pay that price. We need to live openly as Christians and submit to that, submit to whatever it is we need to submit to, whatever the Lord has planned for us, even as Jesus did. He is our example. Let's also not forget to follow the way that He suffered. When the high priest tried to get Him to go against the law by testifying against Himself, Jesus respectfully corrected Him. When He was unjustly abused by the officer, he gently corrected him and basically told him what he should have done. When false witnesses brought false charges against him, Jesus didn't try to defend himself and retaliate. Well, you think I did this? Well, I know what you did. You did this and this and this. I mean, that's, that's the way that we respond when people bring charges against us. Well, I, I, I did this. Well, look what you did. Jesus simply didn't answer them. For one thing, they were all unjust charges. But when lawful authority charged him to speak the truth, Jesus spoke the truth even though he knew to say what he was going to say, he would be rejected, he would be condemned. We need to do things the way Jesus did, and that is when we are mistreated and we have to suffer for doing what is right, that we don't get angry at the people who are making us suffer for doing what is right, but instead we continue to do what is right. And we patiently endure whatever it is the Lord calls us to endure. We don't sin. Finally, let me just simply say this. That if this seems distasteful to you, following Jesus' example, if, if that cost is, is a cost you haven't been willing to pay, if you don't want to follow His example of suffering, or if you believe somehow that you don't need to follow this, then you need to realize you don't know Jesus, because this is what Jesus says. This is what Jesus is all about. This is what the Spirit of God within you is calling you to do.
So if you're not following Jesus, if you have no intention in following His example, if you don't want to follow His example, if you don't want to suffer, if you don't want to you know, uh, separate yourself from the world and stand apart and endure the suffering or the hatred of the world, then you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says we must be willing to do that. Before we can enter into the kingdom of heaven, we have to die to ourselves, pick up our crosses. We have to, well, we have to give up everything, everything in this world, Just let go of everything, not necessarily physically, but in our hearts we have to let go. And we have to be willing to endure whatever reproach is necessary to follow Jesus. If that describes you, then you need to turn away from your sins and trust in Jesus. You can't do these things without Him, you see. You can't make yourself love Jesus in this way. You can't, you can't basically look at what it is He calls you to do. And, and, and like Moses, you know, when you're choosing between the two, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you'll choose the world every time. You'll never be able to choose Christ without His Holy Spirit. He needs to give you His Spirit. So if you don't trust in Him, look to Jesus and ask Him. Ask Him for His Spirit. Ask Him for His grace because He is gracious and He is merciful. And if you do, come to Him sincerely asking Him for this mercy. He will grant you that mercy. As a matter of fact, if you can, if you can come to Him sincerely, it's because He is already showing you Mercy, if you have any concern, any interest at all, it's because He's showing you some measure of mercy. We all need the Lord's mercy, but particularly in this, because we cannot trust Him apart from His work in our hearts. So if you are not following Jesus, if you do not want to follow Jesus, if you don't want to suffer for Jesus, you need to turn to Jesus and you need to ask Him for His mercy. Ask that He would change your heart. Ask that He would save you. Now again, as, we, as we're going through these different parts, we're looking at the, what we call the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, that means sufferings. But this is the obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what He was willing to do. This is what He was willing to suffer for us. And it culminates at the cross. And so as we prepare now to come to the table... Let's remember what it is we've just seen. I don't think any one of us would necessarily want to be in Jesus' place, you know, as standing before this, this um, uh, again, this monkey court, which was the lawful authority in Israel and to be condemned by them and knowing it was rigged in every way against you, knowing they hated you, knowing that the outcome was, was already secure. But Jesus was willing to do that for us. But that love of Jesus is what would make us willing to suffer the, the same thing if the Lord calls us to, to do that. Let's remember what Jesus was willing to suffer for us as we come and celebrate the death of our Lord Jesus Christ at the table. And let me just simply say this too, that we can use the application to judge our own hearts as to whether or not we're really prepared to come to the table because there, there are really two groups of, of people in the world, aren't there? There's those in the kingdom of light and those in the kingdom of darkness, right? There are those who are willing to follow Jesus and who are following Jesus, who are setting themselves apart from the world and suffering for Him, and there are those who are still unwilling. If you're unwilling to do this, don't come to the table because you still need to repent and trust in Jesus. But if you are willing, come to the table that the Lord might give you a greater grace, a greater strength to be able to do what He calls each one of you to do. We need the table. If we want to follow Jesus, we need the table. We need our hearts filled with more of His love. We need to draw closer to Him. We need Him to draw closer to us. The nearness of God is our good. And the nearer He is to us, the more we will love Him and the more we will give ourselves to Him. Well, we can draw near to Him in the table. The table is a communion with Jesus, not just with His body and blood, which we often emphasize when we come to the table, but with Jesus Himself. He is here spiritually to bless us and to draw near to us and to really fill us with His love. But we have to be prepared 
to meet Him at the table by faith through repentance and renewed faith. So let's, let's spend just a few moments now in silent prayer and let's say,